Welcome to the Cleveland Combined Hand Fellowship Lecture Series, sponsored by the Cleveland Clinic and Metro Health. Um, I'm Austin Pitcher. I'm one of the, the hand and upper extremity fellows here at Cleveland Clinic. I'm going to talk a little bit about scapulothoracic dysfunction. There you go. Uh, so just a kind of brief framework. Um, you know, you know scapulothoracic dysfunction includes several different diagnoses, uh, including uh, scapular dyskinesis, uh, sometimes referred to as six scapula syndrome. Uh, which is relatively common, and then a couple more uh, specific diagnoses that I'll get into a little bit more later on, uh, including scapular winging and snapping scapula. Um, just the kind of important uh, unifying condition of all of these is that uh, they can lead to significant dysfunction of the shoulder. Um, just because this is an area of the body that we uh, don't think about all that often, uh, we certainly don't operate on all that often, I'm going to review the anatomy a little bit. Uh, so the scapula itself, it is the largest bone in the shoulder complex. Uh, it's a roughly triangular bone overlying the second to seventh ribs. Uh, and importantly, it, it's the attachment side of at least 17 muscles. Uh, it's stable, it's stabilized by at least three different groups of muscles, including the scapula thoracic, scapula humeral, and the rotator cuff muscles. Uh, the scapula, scapula thoracic articulation is not actually a true joint, uh, but rather the scapula kind of floats over uh, the posterior aspect of the thorax uh, and is held there and mobilized by uh, the muscles I just mentioned. Uh, here's kind of a, a classic netter picture, uh, just giving an illustration of the bone itself. I'm uh, reviewing some of the important musculature. Uh, so we're going to talk mostly about the scapula thoracic stabilizers today, obviously. Um, just a surface anatomy uh, picture up top. Uh, and on the bottom, on the left side here, uh, the big one that you can see is a trapezius muscle, uh, which is a superficial muscle uh, with a very broad uh, origin and insertion. Uh, and then on the right uh, half of this uh, illustration are the deep muscles. I just want to point out the levator scapulae uh, as well as the rhomboids here. Um, I'll go a little bit more into all of these as well. So uh, again, stripping away all the other stuff that we're not going to talk about. Uh, the trapezius is this big uh, broad muscle here on the right. And on the left side, you can see uh, those deeper uh, muscles, including the levator, rhomboid minor, rhomboid major, uh, and then the serratus anterior that we'll talk a fair bit about. Uh, so the straightest anterior uh, has a very uh, broad origin on ribs one through eight uh, and serves in the anteromedial border of the scapula. Uh, it's innervated by the long thoracic nerve, uh, which primarily gets innervation from C5 and 6, a little bit from C7, uh, and a small percentage of people uh, get a little bit of innervation from C4. Um, the action of this is actually divided into three parts. So uh, the upper part uh, up here is uh, primarily responsible for downward rotation of the scapula. Uh, the middle uh, segment is due is responsible for protraction of the scapula that's moving it forward on the thorax. And then the lower portion is uh, responsible for upward rotation and abduction uh, of the scapula. Just kind of a, another view of the same muscle that kind of more cleanly illustrates the three different heads. Um, and again, if you kind of think of you know, the direction of action of these muscles, you can see how the three different heads have slightly different action on the scapula itself. Uh, trapezius is uh, the next big one. Uh, again, very uh, large muscle with a broad origin insertion. So it originates uh, basically from the base of the skull all the way down to the top of the thoracic spine. So medial third of the superior nuchal line, external occipital protuberance, uh, and the nuchal ligaments of C7 to T12 uh, spinous processes. And then it inserts, uh, you know, again, very broadly onto the scapula. So all the way around from the lateral third of the clavicle onto the acromion, and then uh, back down the scapular spine. Uh, it's innervated by the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, this is cranial nerve number 11. Uh, for those of us that have not reviewed our cranial nerves for a while. Um, and the action of this muscle, uh, again, it's divided into kind of three growth segments. Uh, so the upper uh, segment is responsible for upward rotation and elevation of the scapula. Uh, the middle segment is primarily uh, retraction of the scapula. And then the lower segment is responsible for a downward rotation and depression of the scapula. Again, this is a second illustration that kind of shows um, these actions a little bit more clearly. And again, uh, if you pay attention to the ordinary insertion, you can see why these parts would have a slightly different action on the scapula. A couple minor players we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, so rhomboid minor major, uh, two different muscles. So minor originates on C7 and T1 spinous processes. Uh, major uh, originates on the T2 to T5 spinous processes. They both insert on the medial edge of the scapula and they're innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. Uh, compared to the other muscles, these have a little bit more defined uh, limited action, and that is retraction of the scapula. And lastly, uh, the levator. 
uh, originates on the uh, C1 through 4 transverse processes, insertion of the superior medial border of the scapula, and it's innervated by uh, C3 to 4, four uh, plexus, as well as some innervation from the dorsal scapular nerve. Its action is to elevate the scapula, as well as a downward rotation of the glenoid. Um, so kind of analogous to the rotator cuff, uh, I think it's useful to think of these muscles as kind of force couples uh, that work together to stabilize the scapula. Um, you know, and there's been numerous studies kind of looking at these, but the big players are really the, the trapezius and the serratus. Uh, the rhomboids and the levator are relatively minor players. Uh, I actually didn't mention them before, um, but the latissimus and pec minor are also minor stabilizers of the scapula, but we won't really talk about those too much today. Uh, scapular kinematics um, are a little bit uh, complex, and that's because the scapula just has so many range of motion. It's just not a constrained joint. Um, I think it's generally underappreciated how much the scapula moves and how much it contributes to shoulder uh, function. In general, we kind of think of three dimensions of range of motion. So there's elevation and depression, that's moving the scapula up and down uh, on the thorax. There's uh, retraction and protraction. So retraction is moving uh, scapula toward the posterior midline. Uh, protraction is the opposite of that. And then there's upward elevation, downward elevation. That's kind of a rotation of the scapula on the thorax. Um, and I won't dive into the, the specific angles as much, but at rest, the scapula is uh, rotated about 30 degrees anterior uh, and 20 degrees forward on the sagittal plane. And the inferior angle is about three degrees upwards. Um, when you start to abduct the shoulder, uh, in general, uh, there's a two to one ratio of motion between the glenohumeral joint and the scapula thoracic uh, joint. Uh, I'll show that in an illustration in the next slide. For the first 30 degrees of abduction, the scapular center of rotation uh, primarily migrates proximally and laterally. And then for the next 60 degrees of abduction, uh, the scapula begins to rotate upwards. Uh, that's kind of illustrated here. So, you know, for 180 degrees total uh, shoulder range of motion, 120 or so of that come from glenohumeral joint, and you know, the other 60 come from the scapula thoracic uh, articulation. <clears throat> Just some, uh, you know, biomechanical data, you know, looking at this. That's where some of these numbers came from. Uh, so this is on healthy subjects, and they looked at um, relative motion of the scapula to the thorax as well as to the humerus uh, with shoulder motion. And they did this both passively and actively. So uh, active is in the solid lines in all these charts, uh, passive is in the dotted lines. You can see most of these, uh, there's not a lot of difference between passive and active range of motion, um, except for this uh, uh, scapula internal external, external rotation. So uh, with active range of motion, there's more external rotation of the scapula uh, compared to passive. Uh, again, you know, not to beat this slide too much, but I think the, the take home from this is that uh, the scapula isn't just, you know, kind of rotating in one plane, but it's really, you know, moving in three dimensions with uh, shoulder, shoulder motion. <coughs> um, I think the important uh, part about scapula thoracic motion is that any alteration of the normal kinematics um, can have a significant effect on the shoulder function. So, uh, and this ranges from very subtle effects to very profound effects. Uh, changes in muscle balance can result in, you know, changes in the 3D uh, position of the glenohumeral joint in space, uh, increased AC joint strain, um, changes in the subacromial space dimensions, which can lead to impingement. Uh, you can reduce the mechanical advantage of uh, the shoulder girdle muscles. And all of these things together can uh, lead to an overall loss of uh, normal shoulder function. So for, for scapular dyskinesis, again, this can be a little bit of an umbrella diagnosis, but uh, a couple of the major causes. So this top line is probably the most one. So uh, in athletes, especially muscle fatigue, uh, imbalance or inhibition um, can lead to uh, scapular dyskinesis. Also important to think about, you know, any pathology in the AC or glenohumeral joints uh, can lead to uh, scapular thoracic problems, and then it can be bony caused as well. So things such as uh, clavicular malunion, uh, thoracic kyphosis, and then even things like uh, you know osteochondromas on the scapula can uh, inhibit function. And then uh, again, too, that I'm talking talk about a little bit more um, in detail: uh, scapular winging and snapping scapula. So first up, uh, scapular winging. So uh, in general, this is thought to be a rare disorder. Uh, caused by a uh, neuromuscular imbalance between the scapular thoracic stabilizers. True incidence of this is largely unknown. Uh, there's estimates in the, the literature, and those range all the way from like 0 0.0026% uh, to 0.21%. So uh, again, very broad range, uh, but in any case, it's not particularly common. Most case series that I found on 
uh, winging, you know, patient or uh, senior surgeons were seeing, you know, a couple of cases of this in their clinic a year. So it's something that you'll expect to see if you see shoulder problems, but probably not a lot of. It can be caused by uh, lesions to the long thoracic and spinal accessory nerves. Um, and again, both these things have numerous underlying uh, etiologies. I'll go into a little bit more. So again, uh, generally classified as medial versus lateral. Uh, people also classify it as primary versus secondary. Um, historically, people have talked about voluntary winging, uh, but we won't get into that too much. But the kind of unifying factor is that these are all, all things that lead to uh, abnormal scapular thoracic kinematics, uh, which can overload compensatory musculature and then limit muscle strength. <clears throat> First up, medial winging. Uh, here's a classic uh, clinical photograph here. So much more common than lateral winging. Uh, and this is due to, you know, any sort of dysfunction of the serratus anterior, uh, frequently due to injuries to the long thoracic nerve. So different causes. So there can be direct mechanical causes, uh, which are actually probably under-recognized, um, including things like avulsion of the serratus anterior or displaced fractures of the inferior fold of the scapula, uh, which can both lead to winging. These are important to recognize early because these are both uh, things that are frequently treated surgically and have good results if caught early. Uh, neurologic uh, causes are probably the most common, uh, including traction, compression, and direct nerve injuries to the long thoracic nerve, uh, and also things such as uh, uh, brachial neuritis uh, can cause winging. <clears throat> so traction injuries, uh, typically thought to make up about 50% of uh, cases of medial winging. Um, these are usually thought to be due to uh, repetitive stretch with overhead activities uh, being the most common culprit. Usually present with a gradual onset of weakness and winging. Uh, though there can be uh, kind of acute presentations as well. Uh, compressive uh, injuries to the nerve, uh, usually divided into acute versus chronic. So acute things, uh, things such as blunt chest wall trauma, head and neck trauma, often in a setting like a motor vehicle crash or other high energy mechanisms, um, sudden depression of the shoulder girdle, and then surgical uh, positioning is also a, a culprit here. So uh, important to be careful there. Uh, chronic causes, uh, the most common culprit here is compression between the scalene muscles. So the long thoracic nerve passes between the anterior and middle scalene and a hypertrophic middle scalene muscle uh, can cause compression on the nerve. It can also get pinched between the coracoid and the first or second rib, as well as at the anterior inferior scapular border. Uh, direct nerve injuries. Um, a lot of these are iatrogenic, unfortunately. Um, and common culprits here are things like a radical mastectomy with an axillary lymph node dissection. Uh, thoracic surgery, and there have even been case reports of uh, chest tube placement uh, causing uh, injury to the nerve. And then obviously uh, penetrating chest wall trauma can injure the nerve as well. <clears throat> so I, I think the exam here uh, is uh, important just because uh, this can be something that can be easy to miss. Uh, and it can be something where your exam uh, kind of leads you in the right or wrong direction as far as treatment. Um, in general, uh, you'll see inframedial uh, scapula will protrude posteriorly and medially um, away. I have a, another picture uh, shortly that kind of illustrates that maybe a little bit better than this. Uh, and this uh, deformity can be emphasized by a wall press test. So this is a test where uh, typically the serious anterior will engage, uh, but failure for that to engage will make the scapula kind of pop out uh, like this. So you see a very prominent medial border um, and it's you know kind of, medialized compared to the, the contralateral scapula. Um, shoulder range of motion uh, usually has limited range of motion, motion with abduction and forward flexion limited to often below 90 degrees. Uh, and a lot of times this can be improved with a scapular stabilization test. So this is where you manually stabilize the scapula and that should improve both pain and uh, uh, range of motion in a positive test. Um, you know, palpation, again, important. Uh, so any marked tenderness at the medial border of the scapula can really raise concern for any sort of a muscle detachment, uh, which can be acutely surgical. <laughs> a couple uh, different ways to stabilize the scapula uh, illustrated here. Uh, and again, a positive test is when, you know, providing this uh, stability both uh, decreases pain and increases range of motion. Um, as far as further evaluation, uh, EMG uh, should be gotten in most of these uh, patients, if not all of them. Uh, and that's uh, to assess involvement of long thoracic nerve uh, versus any mechanical cause of winging. Uh, it can also show the nature of the injury to the nerve. Uh, and importantly, you should uh, include uh, spinal accessory nerve, uh, long thoracic, as well as the dorsal scapular nerves, uh, just so your you know, diagnosis is accurate and complete. 
uh, pretty much all these patients should get at least plain x-rays. Uh, any advanced imaging may be useful in specific cases, um, you know, particularly uh, to evaluate any mechanical causes. Uh, and this can be particularly useful when there's concern for a muscle detachment, which is uh, seen pretty clearly on MRI. So other than the things that we talked about uh, being acutely operative before, uh, in general, these things are uh, non-operative to start. So these should be, you know, outside of a, you know, clean laceration of the nerve or uh, a fracture or uh, muscular avulsion, these should be observed for a minimum of six months. And most authors will say, you know, observe them for uh, up to two years, um, with the mean time to recovery being approximately nine months uh, in the bigger series here. Uh, patients can do uh, PT for serratus strengthening in the meantime, just to maintain <coughs> as much shoulder motion as possible. Bracing has been described for this. In general, it doesn't work very well and it's poorly tolerated, so not many people recommend that at this point. And again, the vast majority of patients will fully recover in two years. Uh, in cases of uh, serious anterior avulsion or displaced fracture, uh, early repair of that muscle or uh, fracture uh, has been associated with good results. And then cases where uh, EMG shows uh, compression of the long thoracic nerve, um, Failure to improve with uh, non operative stuff for at least six months, again, most authors will say longer than that, uh, has been associated with uh, good results. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, outside of those things, so, you know, it's a, a nerve injury that hasn't recovered for, you know, 18 to, months to two years, and then you're talking about doing uh, some sort of surgery to restore that function. So, the classic surgery here is a, a split uh, pec major transfer where you take the uh, uh, sternal head of the pec major, uh, detach it from its humeral insertion, uh, graft it to improve its uh, increases tendon length, and then insert it onto the, the scapula. Um, and that uh, has been associated with good results. I'll go over a little bit of that. Um, symptomatic improvement uh, with a compression test uh, has been predictive of surgical success, so uh, important to do that exam uh, pre-op again. And then scapula thoracic fusion. Uh, for medial wing, that's generally a, a salvage operation. And the primary goal here is pain relief. Um, I think it's important to talk to patients about kind of limited improvement in shoulder uh, abduction uh, based on the kind of anatomic uh, and kinematic considerations we talked about before. Probably the best you can expect is, you know, 100, 120 degrees or so of abduction uh, if you fuse that joint. Uh, so just an illustration, this is kind of the classic uh, pec major transfer, uh, otherwise known as a uh, uh, Marmor Bechtel uh, transfer. In the original papers, they used a uh, fasciolata uh, autograph. Most people use allograph at this point. Um, but you, again, detach the humeral insertion, uh, pass it around, and then you uh, pass it through a bone window at the inferior angle of the scapula. And this is uh, one of the larger case series looking at uh, transfers. So they found 26 patients with EMG confirmed, confirmed uh, palsy. Mean follow up uh, close to two years. Uh, and following transfer, they had improvement in forward flexion from 112 to 149 degrees, improvement of external rotation from 54 to 63 degrees. And the functional outcome scores also improved significantly. So shoulder function scores went from 28 to 67, which is significant. Um, and their pain scores went from 7.7 .7 to 3.0. Uh, they did have recurrent winging in 15 and five patients. Um, so that's significant. Uh, but overall, these are pretty good results. Um, now on to lateral winging. Uh, again, clinical picture here. I'll show these side by side in a little bit uh, to kind of illustrate. Uh, much less common than medial winging. Uh, and this is typically due to an iatrogenic uh, injury to the spinal accessory nerve. Uh, so it's most vulnerable in the posterior triangle of the neck uh, shown here. Um, and common culprits here are cervical lymph node, biopsy, uh, radical neck dissection, and things like that. Uh, traumatic uh, origins are less common. <laughs> things such as uh, sudden lateral flexion of the neck, uh, deep tissue massage, and penetrating neck injuries can uh, cause injury here. Um, you know, patients come in complaining of very similar things to uh, uh, what they complain about with medial winging. Uh, they may have visible asymmetry of the trapezius, depending on exactly where the level of injury is. Um, and they also may complain of difficulty sitting in a chair, which is a little bit different from uh, the medial winging. Um, you can you know, attempt to differentiate this from medial winging by the position of the scapula um, <coughs> with motion. So uh, in lateral winging, 
um, you're missing this kind of medial constraint, so the scapula rotates down and away uh, from the center of the spine um, compared to the contralateral side. Uh, and again, EMG is useful here to uh, differentiate medial winging, uh, as well as to rule out any more uh, extensive neurologic injuries. Uh, just a side-by-side -side photo, uh, which I think can be useful. So again, lateral wing on the left side here, so you're missing the trapezius uh, force couple here, and the scapula rotates down and kind of away from uh, the center of the spine. His medial winging, uh, you can see he's actively forward flexing here. Uh, so you're missing that kind of uh, anterior uh, constraint and the constraint down to the chest wall. Um, and the um, impact, intact trapezius is kind of rotating the scapula you know, towards the midline and up. So uh, I always had a difficult time remembering this when I was a med student, um, but the, the name of the winging, so lateral winging, medial winging, is the direction that the scapula goes. Um, one, uh, you know, just one slide on this. Uh, so you can get uh, winging due to rhomboid dysfunction specifically. It's usually much more subtle than trapezius weakness because it only kind of has one action uh, and the trapezius makes up some of that work. Uh, the duplication of the rhomboids uh, makes it a little bit difficult uh, to examine. There are a couple Um, so compared to uh, medial winging, uh, indications for conservative management of lateral winging uh, are much more limited, um, and even those are controversial. So this is due to the mechanism of these injuries are usually a uh, you know, complete laceration of the nerve. Early nerve exploration and repair is uh, usually recommended uh, for these, especially the iatrogenic injuries. And these uh, historically have good results if they're repaired within 20 months. Uh, there are also nerve transfers that have been described for this. Um, most of these are small case series, and there's a couple different techniques described. Uh, for late presentations, so more than 20 months after injury, uh, the Eden Lang uh, tendon transfer uh, is an option. I have a picture of that uh, coming up. And then uh, scapular thoracic fusion, uh, again, is an option uh, here. So this is the Eden Lang uh, transfer. So you basically take uh, all these secondary stabilizers of the levator and the rhomboids, and you essentially transfer all of them more laterally uh, onto the scapula uh, to recreate that trapezius um, uh, force pull. Uh, I was doing some questions on this just to make sure I was uh, fully up to date on this. So, uh, you know, this question, 47-year-old man uh, undergoes a posterior cervical procedure for a benign tumor, uh, postoperatively severe dysfunction with decreased uh, forward elevation and abduction develops as he has lateral winging of the scapula. So they tell you the diagnosis here. What is the achievement uh, to restore function and uh, motion here? So give you a whole bunch of different tendon transfer options. So rhomboids and levator uh, transfer is uh, one that we just talked about. Uh, but there's a single comment on this question uh, by Peter Evans saying nerve transfer from uh, suprascapular nerve to spinal accessory nerve. So um, obviously we have some proponents of nerve, tra nerve transfers. Um, but again, these are kind of limited to case series. Uh, one final diagnosis to talk about, uh, snapping scapula. Uh, and this is a, kind of an insidious onset of posterior shoulder pain. Most common in kind of young athletes, uh, typically overhead athletes. Um, and a lot of these patients have a history of an inciting event. Um, but most of them probably uh, are related to repetitive uh, shoulder trauma. Um, a lot of these patients have uh, pain and crepitus at the superior medial border of the scapula. Uh, and they can develop a secondary winging or a limited range of motion. Um, these patients on exam uh, typically have supramedial corner tenderness, uh, and they can have some soft tissue crepitus at the, that spot as well. Um, and these uh, symptoms are typically very easily uh, reproduced by the patient. So you can show them or ask them to show you what hurts, and they'll be able to kind of snap their scapula, or their shoulder back and forth uh, kind of over that area. Uh, and again, they may have some, some winging that you find on exam. Uh, evaluation of these patients, so uh, plain x-rays are uh, usually where we start. And uh, the scapular wise is probably the most useful, and it can show some prominence of the superior medial corner. It can show malunions. Uh, it can show some neoplasms as well. Uh, CT scan with 3D recons uh, can help uh, define the uh, relationship to the superior medial corner. It can also show uh, scapular or uh, rib mal malunions and other malformations as well. So. This image here has a uh, osteochondrome onto the scapula causing snapping scapula. Uh, MRI may be useful uh, to look at uh, bursitis as well as any soft tissue neoplasms that might be causing this. 
Uh, and then EMG, uh, probably useful to rule out any sort of peripheral neuropathies leading to any winging. Um, and if there's any concern for a neck pathology, a cervical MRI to rule out any discogenic etiologies as well. Uh, treatment um, you know, generally starts with non-op things, so physical therapy to kind of improve um, coordination. Retroscapular injections that uh, can be useful both uh, diagnostically and therapeutically. Uh, the technique shown here, so you basically have uh, the patient lay prone and chicken wing to make that uh, edge prominent. Then you just inject a kind of right uh, anterior to the scapula uh, to get into that bursal space. Um, and importantly here, uh, you have to rule out other etiologies that we kind of talked about already. Uh, if patients uh, fail non-operative treatment, uh, there are a number of surgical techniques described. Um, and in general, you're either going to do a bursectomy or excise the uh, uh, supramedial corner of the scapula. I think most authors would recommend excising that corner. Um, and this can be done both uh, open or endoscopic. Um, so just to go into endoscopic because it's a little bit sexier. Uh, this is a kind of recent paper uh, kind of describing a technique again. Um, so you usually make two portals, one kind of at the supramedial corner and then one more inferior uh, for your viewing portal. Uh, and then you can shave down uh, both the bursal tissue and you can get a burn and take down the supramedial corner as well. Um, and they, they described uh, you know, 92 patients that they treated uh, in this manner. Um, mean age of 33 years old, uh, mean follow-up of three and a half years. So eight patients underwent uh, repeat surgery for recurrent symptoms and those patients did well. Um, so they did have improvement in their SF12 scores. Their physical score went from 39 to 45, which is significant. Mental score went from 45 to 49 and a half. And then their shoulder scores actually uh, showed modest improvements of from 52.6 up to 75.8. And their quick dash went from 40.2 down to 24.2. Um, and when surveyed, 70% uh, seven, of these patients said that they would uh, undergo the surgery again. So just to kind of wrap up a couple things. Um, so, you know, the scapulothoracic joint, uh, again, there's a lot of uh, moving players here. Uh, it really uh, results in a subtle balance of the scapular stabilizing muscles, and this is necessary for normal shoulder function. Um, any problems here uh, require an accurate diagnosis of what's actually causing it, uh, because you really don't want to miss um, a couple of these acute things. So specifically, muscular detachment uh, and displaced fractures leading to medial winging, uh, acute lacerations leading to any sort of winging um, are things that you want to catch early because they can be intervened on early. Uh, and have much better results if you get to them early. Um, but in general, uh, kind of traction and compression injuries typically resolve with uh, conservative treatment. Um, that's all I got for you. Here are a few references. Happy to take any questions. Austin, um, I think that was uh, superb. Uh, very, uh, very well uh, presented visually, and uh, the content was great discussion was very, very good. So um, it's kind of a nebulous thing. We don't get it taught very well in residency because it is not, you don't see it a lot. And it's one of those, what do I do with it kind of problems. So there are some orthopedic surgeons uh, around the country have taken this on as their mission. Um, one of them is uh, Kibler, Ben Kibler in uh, Louisville. Uh, Kentucky, and he, not Louisville, and um, uh, where is it, Kentucky, where the there's the Derby is. Um, anyway, he he uh, he's done, he does a lot of these transfers of procedures, and he gets a little bit too far the other way. He's got a little bit over the overboard on it, but um, what you've got to take away from this is define your lateral, medial, and your snapping scapula. Get it, get the diagnosis right, and then if you're not interested in treating it, you know, you certainly get them into some therapy, but get them off to somebody who wants, who has an interest in this stuff, because there are options for these people, and they they can work. Uh, so um, I think it is, uh, um, it's got some future to it. I think it's gaining a little traction as we get experience. Uh, the uh, snapping scapula, you know, I've been doing that time, uh, an arthroscopic procedure, and I find that a very good benefit um, to people who, who are positive 
uh, corticosteroid injection uh, pain relievers. So that seems to work pretty well. I tell him, um, I tell him that you may end up still with some crepitance because crepitance is weird. It's not always what you think it is. I don't think it's always bone on bone. Um, I think some of it's bursal. And when they regrow their bursa, they may get that. So that's not what it's about. It's more about pain with crepitance uh, than anything else. So, Joe, what do you want to pipe in on? If I think you're on the line there. Uh, they did a really nice job, Austin. Um, one of the things I'll uh, remind uh, kids with brachial plexus injuries, uh, they flip that ratio. So uh, they'll use their scapular thoracic joint two degrees for every one degree of motion at the glenohumeral joint. Uh, and I'm glad you cited that paper looking at the uh, two to one ratio uh, because kids with a brachial plexus injury, it's very normal for them to have scapular winging. Uh, because they rely a lot more on that scapulothoracic motion than their uh, glenohumeral joint. <clears throat> For injections of the glenohumeral joint, I don't necessarily make people have to lay prone. Uh, you can do it with them standing up. And uh, like you had in the diagram, by putting their hand on their lower back, it helps, um, you know, prop out the uh, the scapula a little bit. You can get underneath the scapula to get in there and uh, do the injection for diagnostic or uh, therapeutic uh, purposes. Um, but no, I thought overall you did a really nice job presenting the, uh, the topic. When, when you inject, do you go kind of right at the, the medial edge of the spine or do you try to go more at the superior medial corner? The images I all found kind of went right at the kind of mid portion of the, the medial, uh, medial edge, but. Oh yeah. I go right by the medial edge. Cause you can palpate it with your thumb and your other hand. Yep. And then, you know, to shoot just beneath that, uh, and flush to that with the uh, the needle. Yeah, you want to go right at the level of the spine, yeah, out of the corner. So you want to go at the level of the spine, so that gets you in the bursa, and uh, it doesn't get you because otherwise, if you go at the superior corner, you may miss the bursa. So you yeah. want to get at the spine level, and then it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's really easy. The chance of you doing something bad is, I mean, infinitesimal. So don't be worried about it. Just stay close to the scapula. And then you can penetrate deep to that for quite a ways before you're even getting near ribs or anything. So you got a, you got an easy shot there. <laughs> well, it's worth you. doing. And, and I make sure you use enough volume. You know, I make sure you use five cc's, you know, one cc of cortisone and five cc of, uh, so you get a nice big bolus in there, you know. Some people do use them more up to 10. Uh, and that's not even a bad thing either, because if you want to make sure that they're good and numb, uh, uh, to see what their response is, no problem with that either, right? Same amount of steroid, just just uh, distributed a little bit more for your physical uh, exam. Yes. 